Welcome to Principal Center Radio, bringing you the best in professional practice. Here's your host, director of the Principal Center and champion of high-performance instructional leadership, Justin Bader. Welcome, everyone, to Principal Center Radio. I'm your host, Justin Bader, and I'm honored to be joined today by Charlotte Danielson. Ms. Danielson is the creator of the Danielson Framework for Teaching, which is the basis for teacher professional growth and evaluation systems in more than 20 states. Uh, a former economist and a graduate of Cornell, Oxford, and Rutgers, Ms. Danielson has taught at all levels from kindergarten through university and is today an internationally recognized expert in the area of teacher effectiveness, specializing in the design of teacher evaluation systems that both ensure teacher quality and promote professional learning. And now, our feature presentation. Ms. Danielson, welcome to Principal Center Radio. Thank you. So we're here today to talk about the new edition of your book, the second edition of Talk About Teaching, Leading Professional Conversations. I wonder if you could give us some insight into uh, why you wrote this book. What need did you see within our profession that prompted Talk About Teaching? Well, I think there there's actually research on this subject, but a lot of anecdotal evidence that conversation is a primary sort of vehicle for learning for everybody, actually, certainly for teachers, and that and that engaging in conversation is is not a it's not a skill anybody's born with. There are things to learn about it, and the context surrounding professional conversations is important. That is, is it part of an evaluation? Is it part of an exploration of practice? Is it between colleagues? Is it between supervisors and teachers? There's a lot to think through in terms of the context and the structure of the conversation. If our goal, and I think it mostly is, if our goal is for the process to be as valuable to teachers as it can be. Mm. Rick Dufour is fond of saying that there's a, a difference between collaboration and collaboration, that you know, we, we might know how to talk to each other in one way, uh, on one level, but not necessarily have conversations that move professional practice forward. I agree with that. Now, you say in the book that teacher learning is intellectual work, and I think this is something that we, we often miss as administrators, and, and Principal Center Radio has an audience of people who are in that administrator uh, world at that kind of administrative level who maybe supervise teachers or provide support for people who supervise teachers or are involved in professional development. And often we we seem to not really take seriously the idea of teaching and teacher learning as intellectual work. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what that intellectual work uh, means to you and, and what some of the implications of that fact are that it, teacher learning is intellectual work. Well, let's start with the premise that teaching is intellectual work, that teachers make literally hundreds, I mean, people have counted this, actually, hundreds of decisions a day, and often under what you'd have to call, you know, unfavorable circumstances, like often in a hurry, for example, or with incomplete information. They don't know if there are three kids absent today that there might not be more kids absent tomorrow or some, something of that nature. So teaching, and, and, and that's just the beginning of it. I mean, if teachers have to decide between this approach or that approach and which would be most successful based on my students, what I know about my students. And then they often have to also make decisions sort of on the fly uh, while they're teaching. Something's not going well, and they realize that, and so have to make an adjustment. And this is this going on all day long. Um, and it's, it's, so it, it's one of the reasons that teaching is stressful. Now, the other thing we should say about teacher learning is that... Um, is, is that, of course, it's, it's intellectual. All learning is intellectual work. <laughs> I mean, I, it's cognitive work. You're thinking. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that's impossible to uh, dispute that. But the other thing to say is that as good as some teachers are, no lesson is ever perfect. I mean, that's sort of true by definition. Because teaching is so challenging and there are so many things to be thinking about all at the same time, that any lesson could be improved and all teaching can be improved. And that's not saying there's the deficiencies or somebody, you know, isn't, isn't a professional educator. No, it's the nature of the work that could always be done better. And so I see the role 
of an, anybody in a leadership position in schools, whether it's teacher leaders or administrators or supervisors or coaches or mentors or anyone, to be contributing to a culture of professional inquiry in which adult learning, teacher learning, is, as well as student learning, obviously, but teacher learning is part of the mission. And that requires a culture for learning, and, in, and it involves practices that will promote learning. And I would go so far as to say that most of what we do and call it teacher evaluation, no matter if we pay lip service to the notion that the reason, the way, the reason we do teacher evaluation is to strengthen teaching, the procedures we mostly use tend to shut learning down. That is, top-down, judgmental, uh, sort of diagnostic, like, here's what I saw, here's something you should do differently, here are some resources, almost a medical model of diagnosis and prescription. I don't think that's actually very productive for learning. And so I think it's one reason that teachers don't particularly engage with the process. Mm. Well, let's, let's talk about that some more because I'm sure to a few teachers out there, your name is almost a bad word because I know, it the is. system that they're, <laughs> that they're evaluated under... That is you know is named after you but is not necessarily consistent with with what you're talking about here and and I remember hearing you say in you know in in person in presentations that I've I've heard you give that you know if you have a punitive and negative system you know a adding the Danielson framework to it is not necessarily going to you know to fix that single-handedly um what are what are some of the the premises that you think we need to base our professional growth and evaluation systems on because we we do have a legacy of kind of you know judgment and punishment honestly when you know typically our evaluation systems have been satisfactory or unsatisfactory there are rewards and consequences for you know for better or worse evaluations how would you reframe that how do you ask people who are adopting your system to to frame that you know that that set of decisions that they're making when they're designing a new evaluation system to optimize for, for professional growth? First of all, let's just be really clear about a couple of points. I, in my view, schools and school districts have an absolute obligation to ensure good teaching. That is, they, I mean, that's, there has to be a system for quality assurance. I don't, and I would never argue that anything goes and that we don't need that. That simply isn't true. We do. That is, any superintendent or commissioner of education in the state or indeed any principal needs to be able to say to his or her public at any moment that everybody who teaches here is good. And here's how we know. We have a system. And here's what the system is. Here's, here's how we ensure quality. Now, we have to define quality. And, and people have used my framework to do that. And I welcome that so long as the way they do it doesn't undermine the very goal they're trying to achieve, which is to help teaching be better. But, um, but no, so let's, let's just be really clear that, there, that I do not intend ever to suggest that we, we can fudge on the issue of quality assurance. We can't. That's, we're public institutions. We take public money. The public has a right to expect good teaching. I think that's pretty straightforward. What we have to do, though, is do that in such a way that, it's, it, that it actually does promote learning. And in my view, the, as soon that, that the important decision that gets made in a school district in, and that falls under teacher evaluation is what we could call the tenure decision or the continuing contract decision. That is, at what, when, when teachers are set to move from probationary to continuing contract status, that's an important step, very important professional step for both the teacher, obviously, and for the school and for the district. And because once that decision has been made, most teachers have a um, assurance of ongoing employment, and they're really part of the permanent team. So you need to be sure as an administrator you're getting the right people on the bus, and you need to be clear about that. But once you've made that decision... And, and uh, you've got your team, then the entire emphasis, in my view, should be around professional learning. And you should then structure whatever you have to do for evaluation for periodic checks as you do those, but you put most of your HR emphasis on professional growth. 
And then, so then we have to say, well, what promotes that? And in my experience and in my reading of the research, it's around conversation, it's analysis of student work, it's examining practice and alternative practices, and lesson study, and PLCs, and various structural um, structural opportunities for teachers to engage with their colleagues and with their supervisors, but in a learning mode, not an evaluative mode. I'm glad to hear you say that, and I wonder if I have this right. I, I think back to the conversations in evaluation conferences that I had with the best teachers that I, I've ever worked with, you know, that as a, as a supervisor, I remember sitting down and saying, you know, hey, look, you and I both know you are going to be evaluated in, you know, in a satisfactory way here. This, you know, that is not the issue. So let's focus 100% on growth. Let's not even worry about whether we're going to hit every bullet point in our uh, evaluation form. That's my job. I'll write, you know, what I need to write. Um, but, you know, every confidence is there that, that you're satisfactory. So let's focus on growth. Is, is that the way to handle the rest of the evaluation process? I mean, is it, is it okay once we have, have satisfied, um, our, you know, our own curiosity, you know, as to whether we are, um, you know, continuing to employ someone who's doing a good job, um, is, is it okay to just set that aside and, and say, okay, now let's focus on growth? I would. I call that the presumption of competence. You're presuming presumption of competence that you're you're making the presumption and you're saying it out loud and I see no reason not to say it out loud that we both know you're I mean I don't quite know how to say this so it doesn't sound so condescending but you're certainly good enough you know we have a standard for that <laughs> and I don't know what you know I mean people might disagree about that what that is most most people when they use my framework put the the good enough um, at some somewhere like proficient level. Um, although, let's keep something in mind here, that when teachers have a new assignment, shift grade levels, for example, or are teaching a new course at the secondary level, it doesn't start off good. I mean, we ought to be honest about that. M many teachers will sort of revert, if you want to think of it that way, to a basic level performance because they're, they're essentially a new teacher at, at that level. And they're doing everything for the first time, and so some just like with the new teacher, sometimes it's a little rough and a little inconsistent. And it takes usually a couple months for somebody to get their feet under them in a new assignment. And so you, or and another scenario is that if you're doing an observation of a lesson that the teacher's never taught before, um, and but would really like to use the observation as an opportunity for conversation about it and how it could have been strengthened, they're not, going to, they're not going to do something new or take a risk, basically, uh, if they're being judged in a high-stakes way. But if they're being observed and they know that it's safe, it's just like in Component 2A for students, people need to be safe in order to learn. But fear shuts people down. And so your suggestion of taking that judgmental stance off the table, or I call it, uh, you know, a, a, um, an acceptance of confidence, a presumption of confidence. Yes, I, I think what that does is it opens it up and it, and it removes the fear. I think this is, that's very important to do. So it's about setting up the culture in the school for learning, and that, re and that involves safety for everyone, for the teacher, certainly for the kids, but for the, for the teacher and in the teacher's relationship with, with a supervisor. Now, that's why it's easier, though, for teachers to learn from each other or for mentors and coaches who don't have supervisory responsibilities because they're not afraid of judgment, because the judgment not, is not involved. So I think we have to apply those principles to what we do in more formal observations if we're obliged to do those. I'm hearing two issues in what you're talking about there that, uh, you know, we, we do tend to learn better from, you know, from our peers when there's not that fear, there's not that evaluative aspect to the relationship. Um, but as, as I read the first couple of chapters of the book, I was struck by the, uh, the importance of the expertise issue as well. And the, uh, the second chapter is, is about power and leadership in schools in, in talk about teaching. How do you see those two issues of expertise and power 
uh, becoming relevant for the instructional leadership work that administrators do with teachers? Well, ex- let's start with expertise. Um, it is a true statement that many teachers are more expert in what they teach than the uh, principals who nominally supervise them. That, I mean, I think that's just true. And so, and so, there. If we're interested in using any kind of a process to help teachers improve their expertise, and I'm thinking both content and content pedagogical expertise here. Um, that is, what are the you know what are some of the new developments in how to teach science, for example. Um, so, so yes, they're going to learn that more. They're going to learn more from colleagues or from other procedures, going to meetings or, you know, it depends on what they teach and what expertise is available in the, in the building or in the district that they can tap into. But, but there, is a, there is an issue around expertise, and unless a supervisor is, in fact, expert in the subject or the level, that is, many kindergarten teachers and first grade teachers know more about early, early childhood uh, learning and development than their principals, who might have been, you know, a middle school social studies teacher or something, just doesn't have that background. There's a lot to know about early early learning, and so, um, so yeah, expertise is an issue. And so it seems to me now. So let's get to the power and leadership question. We should also never forget that the buck does stop with the principal at the school level. That, and there's tremendous positional authority that resides with the principal. And everybody knows it, which is one reason it's hard not to be fearful, right, for a teacher. It also, though, means that even when a principal doesn't know much about something and, and, um, and ha- doesn't have the relevant expertise but wants to make a suggestion anyway, it might or might not be a good one, to be frank. I mean, let's be honest, right? And so... So these things are intertwined. Now, one of the points I make in the book that I borrowed from uh, Kamsar Giovanni, which I think is so powerful, is that it's, if you think of a pyramid of, of power, a, I, it seems to me that a more productive way to think about it is that it's not so much that the principal has power, although that's true, but, but if we can think of it instead that the ideas have power and the principal's job is to help everybody articulate the ideas. Like, what are the ideas around student learning, around what's important to learn, about how we can best, you know, uh, improve what we know about teaching? Those ideas, now principals have the positional authority to make some of those things happen. They can arrange a schedule so teachers have opportunities to work with each other. Even if what they learn when they work with each other is not coming directly from the principal, but it's coming from a structure, let's say a lesson study uh, structure, that the principal has organized because he or she has the power to do that. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about those those big ideas. And I think this this seems to me to relate to the idea of culture, the idea of vision, the idea of values, and um, Keegan and Leahy's idea of, of you know how the way we talk shapes the way we work. Um, and you have uh, chapter three is is about those big ideas. Uh, could you say more about what big ideas mean and, and how they shape professional conversations? Well, sure. I mean, the important one, I think, well, in this in this era of Common Core or other high level standards. One of the big ideas has to do with what's important for kids to learn, and and we're having to, everybody's having to do some rethink on that, and to update their their thinking. I I welcome it by the way this conversation. I think some of it's gotten pretty badly sidetracked um, by by fear. It seems to me, but but the basic conversation is a good one. That is, we the the future is going to demand graduates of our schools who who think well, who can analyze, problem solve. If we bear in mind that most people in school today, we can't possibly predict, especially if they're young right now, we can't possibly predict in a specific way what they're going to need to know when through, for their careers. Who, who would be so brave as to try that? What we know is that they're going to have to 
be good at learning new things. I mean, any of us who've ever, like, came of age before the computer revolution, I've spent my entire adult life trying to catch up with stuff that my children, I learned it from them, actually. And we all have this experience. But the, but the point is, is a more general one, that we cannot say with any kind of certainty right now what our kids who are in our schools now are going to have to learn and know in order to be successful in their lives and careers. And so one of the biggest gifts we can give them is the ability to learn and to be hungry to learn and so on and so on. So, um, so I think that's pretty uncomfortable, not controversial. That's, that's one of the big ideas. Another big idea has to do with uh, how students learn. And this is a big idea that I uh, have incorporated very, very deeply and very explicitly in my framework. And that is, and anybody who has raised kids knows this, or you even observed young children in a non-school setting, you know that children are intellectually active and physically active, of course, too, but, but intellectually active. They are naturally extremely curious. And in fact, it drives you nuts when they're about three years old and they keep saying, why, why, why? You know, and you say, well, just because that's how it is. You know, you finally sort of give up. But, but they're very curious. And somehow, you know, I've never known an intellectually lazy four-year-old. Now, I've known a lot of intellectually intellectually lazy 14-year-olds, and what causes this? I mean, now, probably a lot of things, but one of the things that kids do between 4 and 14 is go to school. And I would hate to think that that we in schools have helped shut down that natural curiosity. I mean, that would be a terrible indictment. So I think we ought to look at that. And so one of the things we know about kids learning in their natural habitat you like to put it that way, is that they are active in it. And that that and the way we do it in our workshops is that learning is done by the learner through an active intellectual process. And so I think our challenge in schools is to figure out ways, given that we know what it is we want kids to learn, and we know this about kids and their learning, we need to devise sort of methods, activities, tasks, experiences in school so that we'll engage kids in learning what we want them to learn. That is, you know, my framework is a framework for teaching, and of course it's important what teachers do. They organize, they arrange the environment. But when I walk into a classroom to sort of see what's happening, I, of course I pay attention to the teacher, but I really pay attention to the students. What are they doing? What's the nature of what they're being asked to do? And is it intellectually challenging? Is it cognitively demanding? Or are they doing something sort of mindless? Or are they doing something that seems, you know, worthless to them? So, or that they really know already. I mean, we're into a worksheet culture that is not uh, just, it doesn't, shy with how most young children or any children um, operate. So that's the second big idea about how, how kids learn. The third one is um, has to do with motivation. Everything you just said seems to me to apply perfectly to the teacher-supervisor relationship. If you take student-teacher and teacher-supervisor, I mean, every single thing you said applies. No question about it. When I said learning is done by the learner, that's about students and children, and it's also about adults. And so, which is why, if your supervisory relationship between a principal and a teacher is all about, if I'm the principal, I'm telling you what you should have done differently, in most... Who's doing the work. Who's doing the work, exactly. In most, in many, let me put it that way, many uh, observation evaluation systems, the principal does all the work. And so we actually shouldn't be surprised when teachers don't learn anything from it. Why should they? They're not going to learn anything. And, and, but they also, if, if they're also in an environment where they don't feel safe doing something, um, then of course there's going to be no learning. So I, you know, I just think we have to change the paradigm a lot. 
and we could go on about the big ideas, but those are the those are the main ones. Would you be okay with uh, concluding with talking a little bit about some of the uh, kind of the how-to part in the the latter portion of the book about um, you know skills and having different types of informal conversations and finding time? Um, what what do you think is is best for people to hear from the you know the latter part of the book once they understand that some of those framing ideas? Well, there's no question about it that time is the most valuable resource we have or don't have <laughs> enough of. That is, it's it's the most precious resource for both teachers and administrators and uh, our school leaders. And so finding time for conversation both between supervisor and teacher or among teachers is, in my view, the biggest challenge. The, the, other, the other thing to add, though, is that the time, sometimes people manage to find the time but don't use it very well. And so teachers meet on a Thursday afternoon, say grade level team meetings or something, and just sort of talk about the, you know, the weekend coming up or something. That is, it has to be very structured. And, and facilitated conversation among teachers is more productive than, than just random free for all. So there's a real imperative, I think, for everybody in the school, not just the school leaders, to learn how to conduct the conversations and at what stage to inject some in, expertise into the conversation. Right, and I think that's why we why we see the you know the the popularity and the power of things like professional learning communities, and the the structure that they provide. And I, I wanted to ask what your thoughts on this are for for administrators. We I think we often feel as administrators that people come to us and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and sometimes it's it's not really geared toward any particular. Uh, you know, mutual benefit or toward any kind of necessary outcome. Sometimes we have these conversations and we feel like they're not going anywhere professionally. We feel like they're not enhancing people's cognition and they're not enhancing people's practice. And we have these ways of, you know, sometimes people just kind of want us to be, to be their therapist. But I think also sometimes we, we get into kind of normal workplace conversational patterns, you know, water cooler type patterns, you know, you know, how are you doing today? Don't work too hard, you know, that that really kind of conflict with, with our aims in terms of, of improvement. Um, do you have any advice for, for those informal conversations that we tend to get in into as administrators that, you know, maybe are a rapport building opportunity on one level? Uh, you know, can they also be professional conversations, even if they're just quick and in the hallway? How do we, how do we kind of... I'm not sure a five-minute conversation really ha- has much potential for being really productive just because there's, you know, you want to dig into things. But but the I think the, the big idea there is for conversations of whatever length to be focused on solving problems of practice. That is, when if I, if I drop in on a classroom, if I drop in even for 10 minutes, I... I can have an interesting conversation with a teacher later. In fact, I was in a, visiting the school once, and I wanted to go, you know, get a sense of the of the school and the kinds of students that teach school working with and the kind of curriculum they had. I just, so I did. I just dropped in on a bunch of classes and spent about half a day doing that. And got back to talk to the principal, and he wanted to know who his good teachers were. And and I I found I. I, that was not what I was focused on, and I didn't want to have that conversation with them. But I, because when I was in those classrooms, I wasn't thinking about where they were on my rubric. I wanted, to, and in the follow-up conversations with the teachers, I just wanted to ask them some questions, like, "Okay, so tell me about the three kids in the in the back, or how did what did you do yesterday that led to this, or what are you going to try and do tomorrow to to follow up on the on the kids learning today, and and but the three kids in the back, that is, if there were some kids who really seemed to not be engaged, I was interested in the teacher's perspective on that, and the conversation might very well have, and often does, evolve into solving a, a problem, some sort of a problem that the teacher is having. And those conversations are almost always productive. First of all, they're, they're problem. And by the way, that same notion of problem-based experiences is highly effective for students as well. You know, like you have a, a, a jar of beans and hold it up. How many, how many beans do you think are in this jar? And so kids devise different methods of estimating how many beans are in the jar. That's engaging, even though it's completely irrelevant to anything 
it's quite engaging because it's intellectually puzzling and challenging, and it sort of tickles the brain. And those sorts of, that kind of engagement in solving even a small problem uh, is much more, uh, much more engaging to anybody as a learner, to students or adults, than me telling you anything. Yeah, and and I think we we enjoy those conversations more as administrators because we want to get to the point we want to solve solve problems we want to help people we want to be supportive, and uh, and those are some of the the better conversations especially among you know what can be accomplished in a quick conversation that's that's a great outcome but I appreciate again the connections between adult learning and and student learning that uh, you know some of the same big ideas oh yeah it's 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 the same <laughs> it's the same I mean adults are just bigger children. And they have, but many of the, most of the learning principles apply, I think. I just don't see a difference. Could I ask, uh, kind of a, to go in a different direction, um, one thing I've, I've always noticed and, and wondered about your framework is that relative to, to other frameworks for uh, evaluation in particular, uh, the framework for teaching is not very, uh, not very heavy in its emphasis on particular techniques or particular strategies. And I'm, I'm struck by the degree to which it's focused on, you know, the, the conditions, the, the outcomes that are achieved by, by the practice that's, that's taking place. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about why that is and why, you know, compared to say uh, Marzano's framework, which is very uh, technique heavy, you know, are you using this technique? Are you using that technique? Uh, why, did, why did you go in a different direction with your framework? Well, there are a lot of ways to be good, and lots of techniques. Now, I do think that teachers need a repertoire of techniques. I have, I do not dispute that for a moment. I just don't think that that, that a framework for teaching is the place for, to put those techniques. That is, you your goal is for students to be engaged in intellectual work. There are lots of ways to accomplish that. You the the and, and I don't know. I've never talked to Bob Marzano, whom I know fairly well. I haven't ever asked him though this question. What are the big ideas that undergird your uh, your instructional model? And I'm not sure what he'd say. I've tried to be very explicit about that, and 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 also acknowledge that there are many paths to those aims, the aims of student intellectual engagement in important learning. I mean. That's that's a pretty tall order, and it's important and it's big. But and people, there's lots of ways to do that. I would not, I I wouldn't pretend to to prescribe certain techniques. First of all, you know, somebody will discover a better one, and then I mean, it's got a very limited shelf life, in my opinion, if you go to the ground and road work. But also, I think by focusing on the nature of the classroom, you're hoping to to have in your school, the nature of the classrooms and the nature of the learning, then it puts the conversations on a different plane. Now, you can always sort of suggest that somebody look into some different techniques, or you may, as a school leader, know that another teacher uses a technique that looks to you like might really help this teacher solve this particular problem, and so put them in touch with each other. Um, but it's... Uh, I would never want to be prescriptive about techniques. I just don't think it's appropriate. Well, I think we're very obsessed these days, and you know, maybe to some extent rightly so, but I, th I think we're very obsessed these days in education with effect size. Is that something you're hearing a lot about? Um, well, tell me, give me your, your definition of it you, as a statistical concept. Sure. That, you know, there, there have been lots of meta-analyses conducted about the effectiveness of particular strategies, particular techniques, particular practices, and often our understanding of, of exactly what that technique is, you know, may differ from the way it was operationalized in the study, it may differ from the way it was implemented in the schools that were studied. Um, but I, I don't know, I just hear a lot these days about effect size and a lot of interest among school leaders in implementing the, the strategies, the techniques that have the larger effect sizes and, and trying to de-emphasize or move away from those that have been found to have lower effect sizes. Um, and I was, I was interested in your, your comment that we're trying to think here on kind of a different level, um, and I wonder if that's maybe why why effect size and and the, those specific strategies are not something that you talk about so much. Um, I'm not sure if I would quite agree with that. I mean, I what's not to like about focusing on on things that work and and not focusing on things that don't work. I you know who who would I'm I'm not going to say we shouldn't do that. Of course we could, 
Um, but one of the challenges, though, that I think inherent in even having that conversation is what do you use as indicators of working? And if your outcomes are purely in terms of some standardized test, for example, um, is the test measuring the important goals for student learning? I think it forces us into those conversations. If we care about, um, say, student writing is notorious for not lending itself to that kind of analysis, but teachers, but but let's not let's not beat around the bush on this. I mean, it's important for teachers to be able to demonstrate that they have an impact on student learning. The question is always the same one: what counts as evidence? And how can you attribute it to an individual teacher? And in my view, we don't have good methods for that yet. Um, and but that isn't to say we shouldn't be working on it. And I can think of lots of, in my view, the closer to the ground those conversations are, the better. So if I'm going to be in a conversation with my principal about how well my my kids, how much kind of an impact I'm having on my on my students, um, I, let's look at some writing samples from September and May, and 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 so and those are conversations we should be having. We absolutely should be having. So, um, so I would urge people when they're seduced by something that has this big effect size to ask really critical questions about how those effect sizes were measured, and were they measuring the important stuff. Because some of the most important outcomes we have for students don't lend themselves to a bubble test. If we want kids to be thinking in a critical and creative way, that's pretty hard to do on a bubble test. And right, and so and so I worry that if we the more we get seduced into little techniques that we can raise our our test scores on we may be putting our eggs into a basket that is contributing to a mindless sort of schooling. But so I think we have to be really critical in our analysis and our reading of that research. That's not to say that if there's good research and it's measuring the right kind of student outcomes that we shouldn't listen to it, of course we should. Of course we should. But, but don't just adopt it uncritically without asking the harder questions. And I think one of the, the harder questions that we do need to ask ourselves is, what does that practice actually look like? And to, to return to your earlier idea of, you know, of, of teacher cognition and decision making, you know, sometimes using a technique is not just a matter of invoking it, but, but of actually focusing on it and getting better at it. And you know, the, the fidelity of implementation, I think, can, can vary dramatically. And of course, you know, just because the meta-analysis shows a particular effect size doesn't mean we're going to achieve that effect size just because we invoke that strategy. We actually have to get good <laughs> good at it. And there's interesting research, as I'm sure you're aware, on on the, the on what it takes to do something new well, like hours of practice, and um, and sometimes you know like something relatively simple, like like using wait time, for example, in questioning. Well, that turns out to be a non-trivial skill to learn how to do. And because it it all of a sudden means that, you know, you can't really predict what's going to happen. You use wait time and you know, the research says it, and you know it if you've ever done it as a teacher, that the kids will start saying sort of unpredictable things. <laughs> and, and for some teachers, that's a little scary. Um, so, you know... I think we just have to take all the with and but pay attention to that research and uh, but then think about the implications of it and as you point out don't trivialize the role of practice and becoming familiar and doing it you know I don't know what people uh, there, there's a rule of thumb about how long it takes to learn a new skill it's long it's long no question about it well I know we're running short on time so I wanted to ask uh, one final question if I could um, and, and usually this is more of a hypothetical question. I ask uh, a lot of my guests, if you could have your way and have school administrators do one particular thing, and that's not as much of a hypothetical question for you <laughs> <laughs> because you've shaped so many of these, these systems that we're working within. Um, but, you know, if you could have some more direct fiat uh, power, 
what would you like to see all school administrators doing uh, relative to the message that you have in your book, Talk About Teaching? What, what can we do that would make the biggest difference as one kind of takeaway? Well, if I could wave a wand and make every task require everybody to do one thing, it would be for principals to require that their teachers observe a colleague teach twice a year. I mean, I'm making up the number, whatever it is. Just go visit another classroom, another teacher's classroom. And by the way, you'd have to set it up. You'd have to say, you, you find the time and let me know, and I'll take your class um, for one hour or one period. And but the purpose of these observations would not be to give the, the visited teacher feedback or anything. It would be to learn from them, to see how they do things. So, so the observer is the learner, and then to engage in a conversation. And then to do a little reflection on that. What were some some things you saw in that classroom that you think you could use or modify and use? And what are some things that you saw that teacher do, even if the teacher did them well, but that you, you are pretty sure would just not work in your classroom, and why not? And have a conversation about that. And I've, I did try to actually sell this idea once to a high school faculty. <laughs> I don't think I was successful. It's a hard sell because... Teachers are naturally nervous to have anybody visit their classroom, but it's part of creating a culture for learning, for adult learning, and a culture of inquiry. I think that's the biggest challenge that principals have in, in moving practice forward is to create, and, that's, and having teachers observe one another is one way to, to have that culture. It's one expression of the culture. Um, and, and there are, of course, many other other things, but but I think it's a single thing. That, and, and I've talked to people who have done this, and it's they just love it. They they say they it's hard the first time it's hard, and after that it's fabulous. Yeah, well, I think especially when there's that invitation to just go and you know go and listen for your own benefit. See you know see what you can pick up, and and have a conversation about it. Not to provide feedback to the person you're visiting. Not to get into that you know that kind of mindset but really for your, your own learning benefit. And, you know, if, I, if we compare that to our typical evaluation practice where the principal is doing all the work, the teacher is doing basically nothing that they, that they care about, they're basically just enduring the process, um, you know, this seems so much simpler and so much more impactful. So the book is Talk About Teaching, Leading Professional Conversations, second edition. Ms. Danielson, thank you so much for joining me for Principal Center Radio. You're welcome. Good luck to everybody. And now, Justin Bader on High Performance Instructional Leadership. So, High Performance Instructional Leaders, what did you take away from my conversation with Charlotte Danielson about her book, Talk About Teaching, Leading Professional Conversations? Uh, I hope you took seriously her advice there at the end of our interview, that we need to let teachers get into each other's classrooms just for their own learning, not to coach each other, not to provide feedback to each other, but just to listen and to have a conversation and to learn from each other. And I think that can be such a powerful form of, of professional development if we let it happen, more powerful than our typical practice. But the other thing that, that really stands out to me is this distinction between just feedback, where we, we talk with a teacher and we tell them what they should do differently, or maybe we try to get them to say it, but it's still us telling them what they should do differently uh, in kind of, a, kind of a feedback sandwich or kind of a coaching model. What Ms. Danielson is talking about in her book is leading professional conversations, not fixing people's lessons, not telling people what they did wrong, but actually striving to raise the level of cognition and the, the quality of decision making that's going into those lessons. And that's where we get the transfer. That's where we get the long term benefits beyond just kind of a postmortem of a lesson that's not going to be repeated for a year. When we can help teachers improve the quality of their thinking and their future decision making throughout the entire year, that's where we start to see an impact as instructional leaders. And it's important to remember that we're not the only people who can have that impact. Our instructional coaches uh, perhaps are in the best position to have that impact, but teachers working together in PLCs can have that impact on each other. So I want to give my strongest endorsement for Ms. Danielson's book, Talk About Teaching, Leading Professional Conversations. Get that book. Read especially the first couple of chapters where she lays out the, uh, the foundation and the, the philosophy behind this approach. And if you're looking for an evaluation framework, I can say without reservation that her system is 
the best. And it does not solve all of the problems around uh, evaluating teachers and, and building culture, but it is absolutely the, the best foundation and the best framework. You still have some work to do in terms of, of creating a climate where evaluation is taken seriously because teacher quality is a serious issue, but the system is geared toward, uh, after ensuring quality, uh, structured toward providing growth opportunities for our teachers. So you can check that out at danielsongroup.org if you're interested in learning more about Ms. Danielson's framework for teaching. I've been following along with her work since the uh, the late 90s, and the framework for teaching is now in its uh, at least its third revision, and it really is a high-quality document. And in our app repertoire, uh, we designed that app to be used for uh, classroom walkthroughs, formal observations, anytime where you're in the classroom and need to take notes, need to provide written feedback, need to say something, communicate, start a conversation with the teacher, whatever your needs are there. One thing I really want to encourage you to do is have that Danielson framework pulled up so that you can use that language in the uh, the writing that you're doing, whether that's feedback, whether that's documentation, whatever purpose you have for that writing, use that language from the Danielson framework. And the way we've actually designed the repertoire app is that it will actually save phrases that you've put in before. So if you have have pasted in something from the Danielson framework or written your own uh, feedback that uses that same language, the, the repertoire app will remember that and suggest it to you. So you can use it in a different way. You can modify it slightly for the circumstance, uh, but you're not having to, to keep it all in your head. So I hope that improves the quality of your writing when you're working to, to support teachers in their growth and when you're doing evaluations. And you can learn more about that at principalcenter.com. And currently, the Repertoire app is part of the High Performance Instructional Leadership Network. You can learn more about that professional development program at principalcenter.com slash leadership. Thanks for listening to Principal Center Radio. For more great episodes, subscribe on our website at principalcenter.com slash radio. 